Okay, um, welcome everyone. As you can now see from the little windows, uh, my name is uh, George Sirimis. I am the director of the Hellenic Studies program here at Yale University uh, that hosts today's talk. Today's talk is part of a series we are embarking on and uh, I'm very happy that Paul Bushkovich is um, inaugurating this series. It's a series that commemorates um, the start of the Greek Revolution in 1821. Uh, it's, uh, its scope is to look at the impact of the revolution um, outside Greece and specifically beyond the Anglo-American uh, Philhellenic movement that has received the most attention in the scholarship. Um, as I said, this is the first uh, talk. We will have another one towards the end of the month on Ottoman relationships with the uh, uh, United States government during the revolution. And we will continue in the fall with um, a course that um, our uh, colleague, uh, Baris Aslanidis, will be offering called The Age of Revolution, which will also be a comparative perspective and include um, uh, revolutions from Latin America that are usually not uh, discussed in the context of the Greek revolution. Uh, then we will follow with a panel discussion in the fall, also organized by Paris Aslanidis. In the fall, we will also have a, a conference organized by our colleague Maria Gallambu on the reception of the revolution in the Greek American community. And in the planning are two other um, series of talks that are related to the, to the question of uh, nation and state. Uh, one of them will be um, on new minorities in Greece since the 1990s. And the other one will be on diaspora populations that have returned to the state of Greece, uh, but had never been traditionally part of it. So all of these are a kind of um, uh, prism through which to see the multifaceted impact of the revolution and what it means today for us um, Greeks or non-Greeks in the 21st century. I also want to thank today the Council on, on European Studies and the program in Russian, Eurasian and Eastern European uh, Studies at the Macmillan Center at the university. Now, um, I've never really been formally a student of uh, Paul Bushkovich, but I have been his informal student for the last 20 years. Um, and I said, not in the conventional sense of uh, the academic um, encounter, but uh, the older and original symposium. Uh, Paul Bushkovich has graced uh, me and my friends with his friends uh, on numerous occasions. Uh, the last of which was last, um, I think September or August when the measures uh, here uh, were a little bit more relaxed. Uh, we were on the back deck and as usually, uh, Paul, was, Paul and I were engaged in this very animated and enthusiastic uh, discussion about all sorts of things, including the revolution. So that was the occasion and the moment that the idea came into being. And uh, I am very happy to be actually realizing that conversation today. Um, I am not, however, a specialist either in history or in Russian history specifically. So we have invited a former student uh, of uh, Professor Bushkovich, uh, Professor Nikolaus Hrisidis, uh, who works at the Southern Connecticut State University, also a good friend. And both Paul and uh, Nikos have been uh, great supporters of the program and their um, genuine love for the community here is really much appreciated by everyone. So uh, Nico, I'm gonna hand over the baton to you and you can present. Thank you, Thank you very much. I think we have- So many familiar names on the screen. Um, and what I am going to uh, do is very quickly um, say the following. It is my great privilege to introduce Professor Buskovic, um, who has been my advisor, my mentor, and my friend and colleague um, for more than 30 years now. And um, just very briefly, among his many accomplishments, I would like to point out um, some of his books, um, one of them on Peter the Great, The Struggle of Power, or for power, rather, um, another one, Concise History of Russia, which has come out also in Greek for those of you who are interested um, in it. It came out in 2016 under the title Historia des Russias. 
and he has a book coming up in late March, I believe it's going to come out on um, a topic that is um, very um, um, interesting um, uh, for um, those of you who are interested in political history, the succession to the throne on um, in the Russian Empire um, in Russia in the Soviet modern period, shall we say. Now, um, the last thing I'm going to say, and then I'm going to pass on um, the floor or the screen um, to Professor Buskovic, is that um, he has um, exhibited a sustained interest in Greco-Russian conducts over the centuries. And so I think that what you're going to hear today is part of sort of a continuous, shall we say, um, sort of interest and um, in these um, relations. So without further um, ado, it is my great privilege to present to you the Ruben Post Halleck Professor of Russian History at Yale University, Paul Buskovic. Okay, well, thank you, Nikos. Um, all right, well, here we go. Uh, my job today is to talk about the Russian Decembrists as they are called and the Greek Revolution. Um, it's my assumption that this audience already knows the story of the relationships between the Russian Tsars and the Revolu Greek Revolution of 1821. That is, they all know, every, all of you know about Alexander I's refusal to get involved, the change of policy under Tsar Nicholas of the Russian Turkish War that led to um, eventually the Treaty of Adrianople and ultimately to the Con London Convention of 1830, which proclaimed Greek race finally independent. I'm going to talk about something which I understand is much less familiar, both to the Greek audience and maybe in general, um, namely the re Decemberist revolt in Russia and also what was its relationship to the Greek Revolution. Um, what we in Russian history call the Decemberist revolt was an attempt by a group of army officers to overthrow the Tsar that took place on 14th December 1825. They wanted to establish either a republic or a constitutional monarchy. Um, since Russian history is normally not part of the standard curriculum in the history of Europe, um, this revolt is not very well known in the West. In Russia, it's a major turning point, which is still um, uh, remembered and is still discussed. Um, it is also something else which is more relevant to us today. It's part of the cycle of European and even as uh, George pointed out, Latin American revolutions that included the Greek revolution of 1821. Um, for the Russians, it's very difficult to underestimate the importance of the December events from throughout the 19th century and up to the present. Uh, it's been the source of countless books and articles and of course films, television shows, and even an opera. And perhaps more, most important, many of you may not realize that Tolstoy's War and Peace was originally going to be titled The Decembrists. It was going to go not just from 1803 to 1815 as it does, or really 1812 as it does today, the final text, it was supposed to go up to the eve of the Decemberist revolt. Tolstoy finally decided that he had um, too much, would have too much trouble with censorship. And also he decided he couldn't really make sense of the story of the Decemberists unless he covered the earlier years. And also, as Tolstoy realized, nevertheless, the Decemberists make a good story. It's one of conspiracy, drama, heroism, and even romance. I'm not going to cover all that. I'm just going to cover three topics today. This brief story of the revolt itself, what the rebels were trying to achieve, and what was their relationship to the Greeks and the Greek Revolution. Um, I just want to remind you all that the 1820s were a decade of what were in fact liberal revolutions in Europe, revolutions in the name of liberalism. Um, the first was the uh, revolt of Sp in Spain in January of 1820. Um, then in uh, in the July of the same year, there was a revolt of the uh, in the in southern Italy, the so-called Carbonari, who were a group of conspir secret conspiratorial group. 
familiar to you all from other things in Greece. And finally, in the uh, February 1821, the Greek Revolution. The next one was actually the Decemberist revolt in 1825 and the cycle ended in 1830 with the July revolution in France and the Polish revolt in November. So we have a whole decade of this. Of all these movements, only the Greek revolution and the French July revolution of 1830 ended in success. All the rest were suppressed. Um, it's important to remember that all of these revolts took place under the banner of political liberalism. The enemy was autocracy or absolute monarchy. Now, of course, in some cases, primarily Poland, Greece, and Italy, later memory would see them as mainly about nationality rather than political change. But it's the case that all of these national rebels were also trying to establish a constitutional monarchy or even a republic. What is liberalism in the 1820s? Liberalism in continental Europe was very different from what it became in the 20th, 21st and 20th and 21st century. It was not about free market capitalism as in some European countries today, nor was it about minority rights as in the United States. It was the notion simply that the government should represent the people by some sort of elected legislature. And if there was a king, his powers should be constrained by law, or in the case of republics, the president should also be constrained by law, and that there had to be a written constitution. For nations that were not independent, like the Greeks, all of this implied a, a national independence. You couldn't do any of those things if you didn't have your own state. And in fact, as George pointed out, this actually began this cycle of revolutions with the Spanish colonies in the Americas. Um, this classic European political ideology was born out of the need to rethink the experience of the French Revolution and Napoleon. Um, this rethinking involved the educated classes, even in countries that did not directly experience French rule, such as Russia or most of the territories that became Greece after the revolution. Among the Greeks, as you realize, the only people who experienced the French Revolution or its results were, of course, the people of the Ionian Islands and the diaspora Greeks. Um, and I presume that all of you know that story. That is to say, the story of Korais, of Kapodistrias, the Philiki Eteria, and so on. Now, my task is not to talk about that, which I assume you know. Uh, my task is the Russian story. Okay. That Russian story begins in a way very much earlier, but to make it do uh, possible today, I think I just want to make a quick look at Russia in the first quarter of the 19th century, that is to say, the reign of Alexander I, who is known best, of course, for his, uh, we call them, for lack of any other word, um, uh, progressive or reformist tendencies, his gigantic war with Napoleon, and then, of course, his rather unexpected reluctance to support the Greek Revolution. Alexander was a reformer. He was on the throne from 1801 till his death in 1825. He modernized the administrative structure, established universities, and in 1817 and 18, he even freed the serfs in the one area of the Russian Empire, the Baltic provinces, which are today Estonia and Latvia. Up until that moment, all the Estonians and Latvians were serfs. They were ruled by a German nobility who had been there since the Middle Ages. The rest of the Russian Empire, Alexander left with serfdom. Um, uh, he needed reform, and he also, many of his reforms, as we call them, were really a matter of state building because Russia in the early modern era was evolving very quickly. Um, just to take one very simple example so as not to involve you in all this, let's just look at population. All right, the population of Russia in 1600 was about 6 million people. Um, by 1795, it was 30. That's an increase of five times in, in 200 years, which was pretty well unprecedented in the Europe of that time. And by the way, remember that most of the Russian people were serfs, but they were producing enormous numbers of children who all lived to adulthood. Um, 
to cope with these and any many other changes in Russian society, this, the state had to keep modernizing. They had to write down and publish laws. The elite had to be educated. Commerce and industry had to be stimulated and so on. All of this was done by the Tsars, Peter the Great, Catherine the Great, and later Alexander. What the Decemberists were trying to do was to take all these tasks out of the hands of the Tsar and put them in the hands of the people as they understood that phrase. We'll talk later what they all meant about people because it was different for different, different groups. Um, and of course, this task became in their minds much more urgent because Alexander after 1815 seemed to be coming more and more conservative. So let's look briefly at the events, actually what happened in 1825. It's actually a rather dramatic story. Um, the uh, story more or less is this. Since the end of the Napoleonic Wars in 1815, a whole series of secret political societies had formed among officers in the Russian army especially among the elite's guards regiments like the Cavalier Guards in St. Petersburg and in that part of the Russian army, which was called the Second Army, which was quartered in the south, roughly in the U Ukrainian and what were then called New Russian provinces. Um, they had various ideals, which we're going to come to, but the actual revolt that they staged in the 14th of December was the result of com confusion and slow communications at the moment of after the death of Tsar Alexander I. Tsar Alexander I in uh, the fall of 1825 was on an inspection tour of the provinces along the Black Sea coast. And then he died on the 19th of November in the town of Taganrog on the Sea of Azov. Taganrog was a small town. It had only 10,000 people, but it was worth visiting because it was an important export port for Russian grain. And it also had, by the way, a substantial Greek diaspora community. Um, Alexander, when he died, the memorial service that was held for him in the town took place in the church of the Jerusalem Monastery, who was, which had been founded by Ioannis Varvakis, which I think is to some of you probably a familiar name. In any case, it took some days for the news to get to St. Petersburg. And the question immediately arose, okay, who the Tsar is dead, who is the heir? The problem is that Alexander had no children, no sons or even daughters, but he did have several younger brothers. And by Russian succession law that he would thrown out to go to his next brother. That one was Constantine who was not in Petersburg, he was in Warsaw. Why was he in Warsaw? He was in Warsaw because he was the Tsar's viceroy in the Kingdom of Poland. The Kingdom of Poland was an autonomous kingdom within the Russian Empire that had been created by the Congress of Vienna in 1815. Um, the viceroy represented the Tsar, who in his, was the result of this deal was the, not only the Tsar of Russia, but also the King of Poland. The problem with Constantine as a Tsar was twofold. First of all, he had a Polish Catholic wife. That was not a good thing for a Russian Tsar. But even more important, he didn't want to be the Tsar. And in 1823, he told Alexander this and explicitly renounced his rights to the throne. He abdicated and left a document in the hands of his brother, the Tsar. Um, the problem is that almost nobody knew about this document. Uh, the Tsar, their, their mother, the Empress Mother Maria Fyodorovna knew about it, the Metropolitan of Moscow, Filariet, and a small number of dignitaries. Um, Nicholas, the next brother after Constantine, had never seen the document, and nobody had ever officially told him that his older brother had resigned from the throne. Um, the result was that on the news of Alexander's death, Nicholas, who was understood that he was the eldest male in the dynasty in the city of St. Petersburg in the capital, um, th ordered the troops in the city to swear an oath of loyalty to his brother Constantine. Um, this of course created some confusion among the few people who knew what the actual story was. But in any case, Nicholas also sent a letter immediately to his uh, brother Constantine in Warsaw telling him that he was now the Tsar and he'd better come to St. Petersburg. 
um, while the courier was going to Warsaw and coming back, finally that his uh, the, the empress mother and the rest of them decided they'd better tell Nicholas that he was in fact the Tsar, which they did. But he, of course, was a bit of a stickler for formality, and he wouldn't do anything until the letter from his brother actually got back to St. Petersburg. Okay, on the 12th of, of uh, December, the letter from Constantine arrived in St. Petersburg. So legally, Nicholas knew that he was now the Tsar. Meanwhile, while all this is going back and forth, there were rumors starting to spread around the city that Constantine would not be uh, taking the throne with various explanations, some of them quite fantastic. At that moment, the secret societies, political societies among the officers decided to move. Um, they told the soldiers that Constantine was about to lose the throne to his brother. And on the 14th of December, he brought them out on the Senate Square, which is right in the center of St. Petersburg on the river, on the Neva River. And only it's only about a block or two from the Winter Palace. In the Winter Palace was Tsar Nicholas, the uh, imperial family, uh, various dignitaries and soldiers, all of them protected by the uh, Guard Sapper Battalion. And by the way, that is the what you is you see on the poster for this talk. Um, the picture there is a later is a later. Um, uh, imagine imagination of the scene by a military painter from 1861, but it's, I think, relatively accurate for our purposes. In any case, some 3,000 rebels on the Senate Square were facing many more troops that were loyal now to the new Tsar Nicholas. The military governor of St. Petersburg, Count Miloradovich, tried to persuade them to the rebels to give up, and two of the rebels then shot and stabbed him to death. Um, the result was a standoff, which lasted the whole day with everyone standing in the damp snow of a, of a not very cold St. Petersburg winter. And finally, Nicholas ordered some artillery to come up, which fired a couple of times at the rebels who then dispersed. Um, in the South, the Chernigov Regiment tried to stage a revolt in January 1826, but by that time, the leaders in St. Petersburg were already under arrest and the whole thing failed. Okay, the aftermath of this. Altogether, the government arrested about 580 rebels and their sympathizers, almost all of whom were military officers. After months of interrogation, um, 36 of them were sentenced to death. But Nicholas, the Tsar, reduced the sentences um, uh, from death to exile for all but five of them. And five of them were executed, um, two of whom will come back in this story. One is particularly Pavel Pestel, and the other one, Kondraty Relief, and three other men were all hanged finally in 1826. Um, of the rest of the prisoners, 287 were convicted. And about 120 of them were sent to Siberia, where they were supposed to engage in, in some kind of forced labor and, uh, it, and more or less permanent exile. The others, the other sort of 300, were reduced in military rank and sent off to the Caucasus, where they served in Russia's then ongoing wars with the mountain peoples and with Iran. Anyway, what, what about Siberia? Well, this became a great epic in Russian history, much written about in various forms. Um, labor for the Decembrists varied. I mean, the worst part was the open pit silver mines, um, but, for, but not all of them were sent to that. The, uh, most of them ended up working on things like road construction and building bridges or in small factories that the government owns um, scattered around in various places in Siberia. Many of them didn't do any work simply because the government couldn't find any. Um, so therefore they just stayed in prison for most of that time. Um, they were also allowed to bring their wives and families. Uh, this became something of a romantic epic about which even films and, and operas were made and so on. Um, it is something of a story. Many of the wives of the Decembrists were rather young, aristocratic young women, some of them very aristocratic, who had been brought up by French governesses and could barely speak Russian. 
um, much less they also didn't know how to take care of themselves because they'd always been had you know 10 servants around them but they all learned very quickly out in Siberia um, then after a few years the labor semences were all terminated um, and they were for a while just left in prison while they were in prison the Decembrists um, were actually allowed to have books, including French books and newspapers imported from abroad or have their personal libraries sent out to them. Um, and they were allowed to meet their wives two or three times a week. The women lived outside the prisons uh, in various quarters that they found in the towns. Finally, around about 1835, 40, most of them were released from both work and prison and sent uh, to various, to live in various places in Siberia. And almost all of them were immediately snapped up by the local administration because they were desperate for people with education in Siberia to help administer the territory. Um, what they were never allowed to do until Tsar Nicholas died in 1855 was to return to European Russia. So however bad or, or less onerous the sentences were, they were out there for 30 years. Um, by European standards, uh, I think it's fair to say that the repression of the Decemberists was rather mild, although it gave um, you know, the five martyrs to the Russian revolutionary and liberal movements for the next 150 years. I think the reason why they weren't all executed or whatever, or sent to even more drastic prison sentences was that in part, it's because the Russian legal traditions were a little different. Um, Russia alone of the Europe, major European powers did not have the death penalty for murder or theft. You will remember that in England of this time, you could be hanged for stealing a silver spoon. Well, you couldn't actually be executed for murder in the Russian Empire and had never been, it was never possible, had not back to the early 18th century. Um, what was a death penalty crime for absolute sure was plotting against the life of the Tsar. That was serious. And the funny thing about this is, of course, virtually all of the Decemberists were, in fact, guilty of plotting against the life of the Tsar. Um, and they said that in the interrogations. Uh, many of them wanted to have the entire Romana family wiped out, including the women and children. Um, but Tsar Nicholas decided that he wasn't going to execute any of them but the five. I think the reason he was doing that is that Nicholas was, I mean, in the literal sense, a super traditionalist. And he still thought of himself as the just merciful monarch whose uh, mercy would, of course, earn him the love of the people. Um, in any case, the Decemberist revolt became a huge issue in Russian culture and history. Um, part of the reason for it is in that particular generation of the 1820s, many of the most important figures in Russian culture, most famously the poet Alexander Pushkin, were in varying degrees sympathetic and friendly with the Decembrists. Um, it was uh, difficult to write about, but not impossible after 1855 until the revolution. Uh, and it was a central story to the self-image of the liberal intelligentsia. Um, for the Soviets, of course, the Decembrists became a tremendous cult. They didn't care that they were liberals. From their point of view, from the Soviet point of view, to be a liberal in 1825, that's before Marx, remember, is progressive. And also they were revolutionaries, which they liked. Um, the Soviets liked it, that say. Um, needless to say, since 1991, I guess the Decembrists are less popular um, since the historical uh, profession and the intelligentsia generally in Russia now includes a great many admirers of the monarchy and any group that the Soviets approved of in somewhat rather, I must say rather primitive way is always treated with some hostility, um, <clears throat> at least in some circles. All right, um, this was a military revolt. It was a revolt of army officers. Um, most of these officers in the Decemberist movement had fought in the Russian army against Napoleon. Some of them as early as 1805 and 1806. They had seen the battlefield at Austerlitz and Friedland. The foundational experience of life for almost all of them, however, was the 1812 invasion of Russia by Napoleon and the campaigns that followed. 
many of the leading Decemberists entered Paris in 1814 with the Russian army. And in fact, of course, many of these young Russian officers spoke Russian, I'm sorry, spoke French as well or even better than Russian, but this was their first view of Europe, was France in 1814. The France that they encountered, of course, had been exhausted by the endless wars, but it was also uh, the center of an, of an intellectual enterprise of great moment in European history, particularly continental European history, that is to say the construction of liberalism as a political ideology. As I said, or mentioned at the beginning, that came into being as a rethinking of the Enlightenment. Um, the French educated population of France that was politically involved, which was quite considerable group, um, understood that Montesquieu and Rousseau, which they had read in their youth or their parents had read, were all very well, but Montesquieu and Rousseau did not help them to understand the September massacres, the Jacobin dictatorship, the expansion of France and its daughter republics or the rise and fall of Napoleon Bonaparte. They needed to think something out here. Um, the intellectual reaction varied. There was, of course, a conservative camp. The most prominent was, of course, Chateaubriand, whose, re whose response to all this was to um, essentially rehabilitate Catholic Christianity as the center, uh, the desirable center of everyone's thinking, and also to support traditional monarchy. Um, the other, probably more, of the uh, French elite, educated elite, rejected that and decided to go along with an attempt to rethink the traditions of the Enlightenment. Um, the people who did this, who were extremely well known and famous in Europe of the time, Benjamin Constant, um, Germaine de Stal, usually known as Madame de Stal, um, Antoine, uh, Antoine de Stu, Comte de the Count of Tracy, and so on. These were all household names in 1815, uh, essentially constructed an idea and a conception of history that justified a constitutional government and explained that it did not necessarily mean the, the Jacobin terror. The Russian officers who came to Paris in 1814 bought and read all of this stuff. We know enough to know what they read. Um, they were particularly fond of the writings of Madame de Stael, perhaps partly because she had spent 1812 as a refugee from Napoleonic despotism, as she understood it, in the Russian Empire. She, in fact, left France or rather Switzerland where she was shortly before the Napoleonic invasion and got to Russia literally only a few weeks ahead of the French army. She wrote a book in 1818, a sort of essay on long essay on the history of the French Revolution, um, which was absolutely central reading to the Decembrists. If you want one book where they got their ideas from France, that's it. Um, in any case, the Decemberists evolved very quickly in their political ideas during the decade after 1815. Um, many, as they got back to Russia, many of them who were then, I should also say rather young, were had only the vaguest political notions, but things changed quickly. Um, by the, 1817, they had started the first secret society. It became by 1825, it had two branches with the Northern society and Southern society where distinction was at first, um, <coughs> first matter of simply a matter of residence. The Northern society was in St. Petersburg. The, the Southern society was in the second army based in the South of the Russian empire. Um, if you, of course, I assume most of you know the story of the Philokia Teria, and therefore you know that secret revolutionary societies were not unusual in the Europe of the 1820s. And it wasn't just the Russians and the Greeks. This was very big in Italy, uh, where the Carbonari had a whole network throughout um, Italy, also in Spain, and uh, that it, in perhaps less significant in numbers, but significant politically, there was a considerable underground uh, network of Jacobin societies, Republicans in France under the Restoration. Um, 
the two Russian societies were born out of convenience of location, really, the distinction between the two, I mean, but they uh, rather quickly acquired different programs, perhaps only because of the char charisma of certain individuals. In the Southern society, the more radical of the two, um, the dominant personality was Pavel Pestel, whom you will remember was one of the five who was executed. Uh, Pestel was the descendant of a Saxon nobleman who had joined the Russian army in the 18th century. His father had even been the governor general of Siberia. You will see these are not obscure officers out in provincial regiments. Um, he was himself a colonel of a, of a cavalry regiment and he was on the staff of the second army. There were only three or four, actually there were only two serious divisions of the Russian army in this point, the first army in the north, the second army in the south. So he's very high up. Um, uh, Pestel had a very clear political program, which he outlined in a document, which was he did not succeed in destroying and which was picked up by the investigators, which he called Ruskaya Pravda, the Russian justice or Russian truth. It wasn't really a proposed constitution. It was a series of pronouncements on the nature of the state and on what was the meaning of government and proposals, concrete proposals for a provisional government, which he wanted to establish if the, their revolution would be successful. Um, Pestel was a Republican. He wanted a state very similar to the French Republic that existed in the late 1790s between the Jacobin dictatorship and, and Napoleon. It was to be a unitary Republic with a single representative assembly um, not two houses, just one, and a collective presidency composed of five men. There was to be universal male suffrage. In other words, even the peasants were going to get to vote. Um, and most important, serfdom was to be abolished immediately and totally. And the peasants were to be given land. In other words, the estates of the landowners were to the noblemen were to be divided up, some part for the nobility and a very large part for the peasants. And in fact, there was a third portion that he wanted given to the peasant community as a kind of insurance against impoverishment. Um, this is a unitary republic like France. The country was to be divided up into departments that are based on geography, not ethnicity. Um, you will remember that in the French Republic then and to this day, there is no department called Alsace or whatever, or Brittany or something like that. It's a, it's a purely geographical dis distinction. Um, there was to be absolute equality before the law and also uniform law, no local statutes of any kind. And of course, Russian was to be the state language. The only issue that he thought of what we would call nationality that was relevant in Pestel's mind was Poland. And they could never quite, he, he and the, we tried to negotiate with some of the Polish groups. They never resolved that, but at least he thought it ought to be a distinct political unit. The leader of the Northern Society, who was one Nikita Muravyov, had a different vision. Muravyov's constitution had, a, was, this was a constitutional monarchy. There were to be a hereditary emperor with some executive power, but the source of law was to be a legislature with an upper and lower house. And by the way, he borrowed much of that structure from the US constitution. Muravyov loved reading constitutions. He had several uh, books in which the American and all the American state constitutions were translated into French so that he could read them. Um, the, there were to be 13 states plus the region of Moscow, and so the state was uh, going to be a federation. Uh, only, but with Muravyov, only male property owners had the right to vote, not the peasantry. Most of the peasantry would not end up voting because the property qualification was reasonably high. Serfdom was to be abolished, but the peasants were not going to get any of the land. So this was a much more moderate constitution. Um, the, these are the Decemberists. This is what they were trying to accomplish. As you note, the two groups or the goals are not perfectly consistent, but they at least were united on getting rid of the existing autocratic monarchy. <clears throat> you will also note that the issue of nationality, which was central to the Greek Revolution and also to the Italians, don't forget, um, uh, is not there. 
they're not concerned about this. Um, their Decemberist conception of patriotism, and they were very patriotic about Russia, was statist. It wasn't ethnic. The loyalty that you were supposed to have, <coughs> excuse me, as a Russian was to the state, the future republic or the future constitutional monarchy. Um, it also, I think, is fair to say that part of the reason why this was seemed very natural is that the secret societies were almost entirely Russian. Um, Russia was a multinational empire and the army was in fact particularly multinational on the officer level. Um, but the fellow officers of the Russian Decemberists in the army who were not from, who were noblemen for sure, but not Russians, that is to say the Baltic Germans, the Finns, and the small Ukrainian Cossack nobility, these people were almost all empire loyalists. I mean, they were monarchists. It was the Russians who wanted a republic, not the Baltic Germans or the Finns or the Ukrainian nobility. Um, in any case, while all these uh, groups existed and were um, talking endlessly, arguing about the future, reading about the current politics, uh, having meeting after meeting, the Greek Revolution comes in in 1821, right in the middle of this. And so this is the part of the story which I now want to get to. Um, the, of course, the part of the stimulus, as I mentioned earlier, I think this is fair to say, one of the many things that stimulated the uh, Decemberists to oppose the monarchy was in fact the refusal of Alexander to support the Greeks. Um, this seemed to them you know, utterly unacceptable and even a little bit incomprehensible. Uh, but it, it understand, if you understand what was going on, as I say, I don't want to go into the great power story, but I think it's helpful to remind you of the situation briefly. Um, the problem basically for Alexander was that the Russian, uh, aside from his views of revolution, there was a much more basic problem, which is that the Russian em empire was simply not strong enough in the 1820s to act totally independently. Uh, we think of Russia as a huge power, at least in European stand standards. And it's true that they had carried the heaviest burden in defeating Napoleon. For a short time, Russia had enormous prestige. The Benjamin Constant that I mentioned, who was one of the leaders of French liberalism and therefore a great opponent of Napoleon, wrote in 1813 as the Allied armies were marching through Germany toward France, he wrote, and I quote, the flames of Moscow have been the dawn of liberty. He's talking about the burning of Moscow in 1812. But Russia was in no way a dominant power. It had huge population, but it was not um, uh, huge, sorry, huge territory. But in population, it was only a little bit more populous than France. France had about at this point 35 or 40 million people. Russia had 55. I mean, and then there were all the other European countries. And in many ways, out of the Napoleonic Wars, the most successful uh, of the allies had been Britain. I mean, Britain was moving at this point very rapidly toward dominating the world as it did for much of the 19th century. And that's partly because it fought against Napoleon an extremely expensive naval war, but it didn't take the enormous casualties that the other countries did. And also it was much more advanced economically. The result for Russia in the 1820s was a little bit like 1945. Um, you know, after all, Russia had, taken, uh, inflicted 85% of the casualties that the Third Reich lost, but all it got as far as a reward was Poland and Yugoslavia, whereas the Americans got the world. Um, so there we are. So the Alexander, of course, could easily tell everybody, and he did frequently, first, the Greeks are rebels, and second, we're not strong enough. Um, the Decemberists didn't, didn't care or know anything about this. From their point of view, this was just another crime of the autocracy. So what did they think about the Greeks? Um, that's uh, complicated because, of course, they had no public, um, public, they didn't have any publications. There was no journal that they could publish. They were a secret society. Uh, there wasn't any, there were plenty of journals in Russia, but they didn't publish them. Um, we have the constitutions that they made, of course. Uh, 
But we also have a couple of other things which are quite important. Uh, one is that we have, um, we know about what the relationships of the De Decembris were with Ypsilanti and the Philikia Teria in Edessa and Kishinev in 1820 and 21. And most of all, we have the same Pavel Pestel's reports on the beginning of the Ypsilanti revolt in Moldavia. Um, this is sort of a curiosity of, you know, a paradox. Um, Ypsilanti, of course, you remember, was an officer in the Russian army and was, in fact, a, a, a major general when he decided to join the revolt and head the revolt in the, in the uh, principalities. <clears throat> he had met many of the Decembrists. Um, but when the revolt actually, <clears throat> excuse me, started in February 1825, it very quickly came to the attention of the uh, officers in command of the Russian Second Army. So they decided to send someone down to the border to see what was going on. And that person was Pavel Pestel, um, who was very much trusted by his commander. Um, the commander of the Second Army was, of course, well, well, of course, well, I was going to say, of course, was a German, Count Peter zu sein Wittgenstein, one of the many Germans serving in the Russian army. And his, but his second in command was Count Pavel Kisilyov, who was an impeccably Russian um, <clears throat> and was also friendly, though not really very sympathetic with many of the Decembrists. In any case, neither of them knew that Pestel was running a secret revolutionary society. They sent him down to the border simply because they thought he was highly capable. So he produced a report. He actually produced two. One, um, an official report in Russian, which was then sent on to Petersburg, and a more, somewhat more informal one in French and a letter to Kisilyov. Um, what the what Pestel did was, first of all, to describe the events of the revolt. Uh, he does this in some detail. Some of it is accurate. Some of it is rumors. And it seems fairly clear that he was getting his rumors from the Greeks, not from the, the surrounding population. He, ta he tells the uh, command about the uh, revolt of Tudor Vladimirescu, the Romanian who started his own revolt a couple of days before Ypsilanti. He tells you about how Ypsilanti went to the Moldavian capital of Yash, um, he's, the initial contacts and fights with the Turks, um, what uh, Pestel calls massacres or murder of Turkish, small Turkish garrisons around there. And he also says, and I'm quoting here, that Ypsilanti, quote, issued several proclamations to the Greeks and the Greek forces. These proclamations consist, like all such documents, of high-flown words, striking expressions, and proud memories of long past centuries. Nevertheless, they made a strong impression on the Greeks who came to Yash from all sides. Um, end of quote. Uh, he, tells the, uh, he tells the readers that hundreds of Greeks were coming from Kishinev, Odessa, uh, and that he had by March already some 3,000 soldiers and was moving to the south. This is all the narrative part. It's very standard. Um, he then went on to describe the Philikia Teria in some length. Uh, his description of how the internal structure worked is fairly accurate and had to come from them. Um, he also gave the very exaggerated numbers. He claimed there were 200,000, but that's also, and he attributes those numbers particularly to, for, directly to Ypsilanti. Um, he then went on to assess the, the chances of success of the Greek revolt. He was quite optimistic. Uh, he said that, uh, again, maybe he was just hearing this, repeating what he heard from the Greeks, but he was very optimistic. He noted that Ali Pasha in um, uh, Yanina uh, was, had come out in support of the revolt. This was, of course, not true, but a lot of people believed it in those weeks. Uh, he also reported that the Turkish fleet had so many Greek sailors and that, there were, that it would be unreliable and that the Greek merchant fleet would be of great help to the revolution, which by the way, we know is true. Um, either he thought there were other factors that would help the Greeks. One was that Sultan Mahmoud II was supposedly ill and that Ali Pasha had bribed many of the officials in the divan. This was a little more questionable. The second was, which was more accurate, was that the revolt in Italy was occupying Metternich and the Austrians, and so they would not be able to do anything uh, to help the Turks. This was correct. 
Um, and in the background, he also had picked up the rumors of an approaching war between the Ottomans and Iran. That was also correct. Um, so he is giving a somewhat over optimistic account of the prospects of the Greek revolt. But in, 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 in the earlier letter that he had written in French to Kisilyov, it's sort of the same thing, but there are a few more details. Uh, he notes there how many of the, at least he claims that, that many of the Greek, uh, so, sorry, many of the soldiers in the Greek army uh, in the Balkans were actually Romanian, uh, sorry, were actually Albanians. Um, Albanians who had served as soldiers for the uh, Moldavian and Wallachian Hospodars and had now gone over to join the Greeks. He also presented it to Kisilyov, though not in the official report, a number of things that were clearly more like rumors. He was convinced, first of all, that, um, that uh, Vladimir Escu was not really his own man, but was an agent of the previous Hospodar of Wallachia, Jan Karaja. Um, he also believed that uh, he also believed that Ypsilanti himself was, as he put it, the instrument of a hidden power who serves, who serves his with, who uses his name only as a rallying point. He doesn't say who this hidden power was, but apparently many Greeks at the time believed that. He also was not very positive personally about Ypsilanti. Um, he describes him as. Uh, at one point, he says he is, after all, a deserter, if you want to put the, the right name on it, because he was still technically an officer. Well, not technically, he just was an officer in the Russian army. Um, so these are rather curious documents. He's very optimistic about the revolt, not very positive about Ypsilanti, but not entirely condemning him either. Um, and he was really impressed by the size and organization of the Philiki Eteria. Well, since he was himself running a secret society, maybe this was perhaps the most interesting thing. The other body of information about what the Decemberists thought about uh, the Greek revolt is the poets. Um, there are several several accounts here that are interesting. Pushkin himself, very shortly after the revolt in the spring of 1821, wrote a letter to one of his friends who was, we know the friend, not Pushkin, was a member of one of the secret societies, in fact, Pestel's society in the South. And his the wording of the letter is almost the same as in Pestel's report making you wonder, were they listening to the same people or where did he see the text? It's hard to say. But there's one important difference, which is that Pushkin was very positive about Ypsilanti. Um, his, he, his comment was that whether he wins or lose, now he belongs to history, um, which is interesting. But Pushkin was not himself a Decemberist. Uh, the more direct evidence comes from the Decemberist poets. Now, I think I should say something about this. I mean, in... Uh, how shall I put this politely? In, 20th, in 21st century America, and probably much of Europe as well, poetry would be regarded as something rather unimportant and marginal, and particularly in events like this. The, as we all know, the press runs of modern poets are tiny, and people, frankly, don't read much of it. Um, but in the 19th century, you have to remember that poetry was a gigantic enterprise. It was the more important poets were incredibly popular, were very widely read. People memorized the, their work. They declaimed them in public at meetings to great applause from the general population. Um, it was a huge form of, of literary and also just cultural expression, maybe more important in the early 19th century still than prose uh, in any case. Um, so the result is, so this was true, of course, in Russia as well. I mean, not just other countries. Okay, so what did they say? Well, um, one of the more prominent Decemberist poets, he's not the most uh, <clears throat> artistic of Russian poets in the 19th century, but he wrote a lot and was widely read, was Kondraty Rilev, who was one of the five who were hanged at the end of the revolt. Um, and he took a, uh, occasion, the occasion of Byron's death at Missolonghi in 1824 to produce poetry on this subject. 
Um, he, his poetry was unambiguous in his reliefs, support for Holy Greece, as he called it. And he wrote that he wrote in the poem that, quote, the friends of freedom and of Greece now weep in reproach of fate. Only tyrants and slaves rejoice at Byron's southern death. That's pretty clear, isn't it? Um, needless to say, this verse was not published at the time. It circulated in manuscript, both among the future rebels and among the educated elite generally. Another Decemberist poet who's a bit of an oddity um, in many ways is Wilhelm Kuchelbecker, which of course, as you understand, is not a Russian name. Um, he was one of these Russian Germans, but he uh, did not identify with the Baltic German community. He identified with the Russians, and in spite of his very uh, thorough German culture, he wrote all of his poetry, including his private diaries, they're all written in Russian. Um, Kuchelbecker uh, took the, also the occasion of Byron's death. Um, and he produced, and he was able to publish it. Uh, he actually managed to publish a, a rather long poem in a journal which he edited with a friend, which was perfectly legal. This was circulated around the Russian Empire without difficulty. His poem, he writes simply that the free, on Byron's death, quote, the free Greek lowered his sword and Hellas wept, and then on for some pages on this general topic. Uh, I think it's important to realize just how important some of this um, poetic creation of this time was. Uh, people in the Russia, educated Russians all had what were called albums, not both men and women, which were uh, usually in their drawing rooms. And at these various social gatherings, it was the custom to write you know, little poems and so on in them. Some of the poetry that we know from the Decemberists is preserved in these albums. Um, they also circulated a great deal of poetry in manuscript, not only because it, they didn't want it to be censored, it's just that publishing it was complicated, they weren't sure, you know, how big the audience was going to be and so on, and poems are short, you know, you can do two pages. Um, and there are, of course, thousands of these things in the manuscript collections of Russian libraries from this period. Uh, it's quite possible that poetry was even more important in the Russian culture of the time than it was in France or England, perhaps. Um, I don't know, but it certainly was absolutely central. And the poetry that we have from the Russian Decemberists is, of course, unambiguously pro-Greek. The it uh, wasn't just poetry, of course, they read the Decemberists, we know that they read regularly French and other Western newspapers. Uh, and also they used the Western accounts that were already coming out very quickly uh, of um, the D Greek revolt, particularly the one they used as the work of one Olivier Voutier, who was a French officer who fought for the Greeks. Is probably more famous because he was the discoverer of the Venus de Milo that's in the Louvre before the Greek revolt. But anyway, they used his book as a kind of agitational uh, literature to give to young officers to learn what the ideals were of freedom and of revolution. The Greek revolt was clearly a big inspiration to the Russians. It served also as a kind of propaganda uh, and it was something that you could even in some forms like the case of the death of Byron, you could even publish this without too much difficulty. So let me conclude this um, long story. Uh, as I say, the, I think that it's a fair statement that the story of the Alexander I's hesitation over the Greek revolt, the intervention then of the conservative Tsar Nicholas, and various things connected with that has overshadowed, at least outside of Russia, the enthusiasm of, sorry, has overshadowed the story of the Decemberists and their connections and their reaction to the Greek struggle. Nicholas, of course, and the conservative camp in Russia saw the Greek events as a fight for orthodoxy and also a Russian uh, an opportunity to advance Russian interests in the Balkans and in the Caucasus. For the Decemberists, in contrast, it was a war for freedom, but at its heart was the same as theirs. That's the way they saw it. The Decemberist legacy is, of course, still alive in Russia. 
um, the debate is in many ways still in the same terms as it was 100 years ago, whether you should see them as liberals or revolutionaries or as traitors to the great Tsar. This de debate will probably never be resolved among the Russians, but the story of the Decemberists remains a drama. And on the, on the stage of that Russian tragedy, you should remember, that is the Decemberist story, standing in the wings, so to speak, um, are the main characters of a completely different drama, that is to say, the Greek Revolution. Thank you. Great. Thank you so much, Paul. I do not see any questions yet on the Q&A uh, window, so let me begin with one uh, myself. Actually, no, there is one question here in the chat room. Um, okay, uh, this is from Paris Aslanidis. Oh. It has three questions. I'll read uh, all three and you choose which one you okay. want to answer, Paul. Okay, right. one, did the Decembrists desire to retain the uh, of China mere as a social unit or mm -hmm. was it their economic okay, program second. more modernizing in some sense? Yeah. The second one is, uh, you can probably see the question in the chat. Um, well, I'll listen to you, yes. George, just give me. The second one is, did the Orthodox Church express an opinion on the revolt? Were, these, uh, were mm -hmm. there any priests involved? Mm -hmm. And the third one, um, are there any Decembrists echoes in the Nar Narodon Narodniki affair later in the 19th century? Okay, um, I can answer all of those very quickly. Uh, the Pastel's plan for the what to do with the peasants when they were liberated had in it a provision that some part of the land, he would not specified how much, should be set apart and in other words, should be given to the community. Most of the peasants were to get an individual farm, period but there should be some part set apart for the community because he was afraid that if you just had everybody gets a, a bit of land, they would be quickly develop an impoverished agricultural proletariat. Um, on the uh, church, the answer is no, the church was uniformly against it. Um, and there were no priests involved. <clears throat> and on the, um, but the third one was about the Narodniki. Well, yes, it was in a sense because the uh, in the 1850s the, and 60s, the heritage you might say, or the legacy of the Decemberists really sort of divides up. The liberals who were not trying any longer to have any revolutions, nevertheless looked back to them as the first Russians to have a kind of liberal ideology. The revolutionaries, the Narodniki that he's talking about, starting with Herzen and then the followers, yes, they made a huge cult out of the Decemberists. It was a huge big deal for them. Um, they were the ones who published, in many cases, the, some of the Decemberist memoirs were, that were published abroad by the revolutionary presses, et cetera, et cetera. And they wrote a great deal about it. Great. Um, there is a question from uh, Yanis Karas uh, on the relationship between the Decembrists and uh, religion. Ah. Um, did it play uh, part in their um, support of the Greek Revolution? Very little. Very little. I mean, the Decembrists were not atheists, you know, mm -hmm. and many of them had um, uh, somewhat nebulous, I mean, like many of the Russian intelligentsia, like, of course they went to church, fine. But their actual religious conceptions, those that had them, tended to come from all sorts of things, mostly Western reading, some Protestant, some Catholic, about various books that were trying to deliver to you a kind of inner Christianity, which they, for most of them, went along well with the Orthodox Church. You went to the service, then you went home and read this sort of thing. <coughs> um, the, um, they, it was not for them a big issue. They didn't, they were in the constitutions, if I remember, the church loses its property. Um, and it's not, however, also going to be, and they were going to have them paid a salary, but also, also the other religions, the priests would get a salary and also the other religions. Um, I mean, the church didn't have that much property since Catherine had secularized the monastery estates in the 18th century, but it had some, a lot of here and there, forests and so on that were valuable. It, it wasn't really a polarized issue. 
I think that's the basic. The mm -hmm. other thing is, of course, in the way it religion played a role in another way, which is that um, I think something that uh, this is partly a guess that may have given a little cover to the Decemberists on the Greek issue, not on other ones, was that the you could write a poem or publish in favor of the Greek revolt without specifying exactly what it is that you like about it, just say it's great. Um, because there was a very substantial conservative camp in Russia that was pro-Greek. Um, I mean, they were largely in opposition to Alexander, but of course, once Nicholas gets into it, they're on his side. Um, <clears throat> and there were a number of publicists, of which the most important is Alexander Sturza, um, who were supporting the Greeks on essentially religious grounds. He was not, obviously, he was against the Decemberists. He thought they were terrible and fiendish, but he was agreed with them on the Greek issue for different reasons. He thought it was a religious question. Um, it's also the case that a lot of, and this helped in another way, which is that uh, I wasn't, I don't know how much has been written about this, but I was looking in preparation for this talk that many of the journals of that time are easily now accessible on, online. And I was surprised at how much material about the Greek revolt there was in 1821. I didn't, didn't have time to go through it all the way to 25, but for the first year, there's quite a lot of material. And it's also obviously, um, extremely sympathetic. And what is particularly striking is I went back and looked at 1820 in the same journals and saw their descriptions of the Spanish and Italian revolts in 1820 and uh, the, the previous year. They're very negative. Those are solidly monarchist. Then you get to the Greek revolt. Somehow this revolt is a good thing. And part of it is religion, but it just in general, it seems to be a good idea and that the Greeks are clearly good people and so on. Um, they also reprinted, um, I think the only country other than Russia that had a, sub in Europe, continental Europe anyway, that had a substantial pro-Greek camp that was conservative, not liberal, was, it was France. Both Chateaubriand and also Bonal wrote things in favor of the Greeks, somewhat like Sturza in Russia saying, these are Christians fighting Muslim. The Turkish state is not legitimate, it's barbaric and, and uh, the Greeks are not citizens of a legitimate monarchy, they're just slaves. And so it's okay to be a conservative and fight the revolution in Spain and Italy, but it's not okay to not support the Greeks. You have to support the Greeks. But you know that was a minority view among West European conservatives. In Russia, it was maybe more important. Uh, great. I have among a follow-up question to this topic. If uh, we can continue with this one, sure. And there's another question about the relationship, uh, if there was one, between Greek commercial shipping and the Decembrists. But my question relates well, to the poets and what it is that they bring to the conversation through Byron. Uh, and whether um, a kind of uh, British uh, Philhellenism filters into Russian poetry uh, and obscures the Byzantine relationship. It, was a, it sounds like Holy Greece could be Holy Ancient Greece or Holy Byzantine Greece. That's very ambiguous. I think they're yeah. being consciously ambiguous. So there's, there's keeping away from distinguishing the periods that for Byron are formative in the poetry that he writes about these. Well, okay. I think that there is a purely, I mean, there's a purely kind of uh, cultural <laughs> literary issue with Byron. Byron, of course, nobody could read English practically. So they all read Byron in French translations. Um, but he uh, made a big impact along with a whole series of other Western writers at this time. This is also the moment in which the Russians get really involved in uh, German literature. And mm. the, um, there are a side, which is another language that more people read German than English, but um, it was still not the universal foreign language. Uh, but they were reading Schiller. Let's see. Um, and that, uh, for instance, um, Schiller's uh, play about Joan of Arc um, was uh, translated into Russian and was widely read by the Russians. 
Um, and of course, Schiller is another one like Byron. I, he didn't live long enough to get involved with the Greek revolt, but you know, Schiller was to many liberals of the 19th century, one of the great poets of liberty. Mm -hmm. That's the way he was interpreted. Um, and so they get all of this stuff coming in together with Madame de Stael and Benjamin Constant and the political writings is all coming in and kind of a stream. <clears throat> Byron was for them a little bit a disembodied figure because they didn't know the English background. Mm -hmm. They didn't read other English writers in any significant amount. A few of them were um, are mentioned, many were available in French, many were not. Um, they were not much translated into English. I mean, sorry, into Russian. So he was rather disembodied. Um, also, they mostly were impressed by his <clears throat> earlier writings, which don't have anything to do with the Greek revolt. Mm -hmm. um, they were particularly, you know, I, I, you, they're mentioned. And if you read these poets and their correspondence, you can see what they were reading. Uh, so, <clears throat> and I think also, but because he was a poet and was a bit, you know, disembodied from, certainly from English politics about which they didn't know much. I mean, he wasn't in reality disconnected to English politics, but the Russians didn't know that side. I think that that 1824 death of Byron, they just seized on this because look, this guy is an important writer. They all liked his work and they thought, great, we can write about this and even publish it. Yeah. And so it became, and there are actually, I mean, I just saw some, I mean, I just had time to leaf through a few articles, but besides, there are also poems on Byron by Russian poets who were not part of the secret societies. Mm -hmm. I mean, about his death and, and the same sort of idea that he's, you know, because as I say, you could be actually in Russia fairly conservative and be pro-Greek. Yeah. Yeah, and of course his his biggest work on Greece is probably Child Harold's Pilgrimage, yes, which is which begins in eighteen twelve, and I'm guessing they didn't read his notes to that poem, which are almost the opposite of the poem, where he basically says Greece will have to come under the protection of some great power because the Greeks clearly cannot rule themselves. Ah, so, well. It's a longer story there. There is another question, uh, Paul, and this probably would be our last one. If there was any relationship between the Greek commercial uh, shipping in Russia and the Decembrists? Well, not directly, but of course there was this relationship, which is that the Greek commercial shipping was heavily based on these Russian towns, like um, uh, primarily Odessa. Um, but also some of the other places, including small places like the Taganrog that I mentioned, um, as I think is well known fact to Greeks that the um, the uh, Philikiateria was quite uh, numerous in Odessa, and there is a whole story about the um, there were Greek cultural institutions that commercial high school with which Kapodistrias was involved in and on and on and on. And all of that was set only could be there because of the fact of the Greek commercial shipping. I mean, there were other European ships going back and forth. Um, yes, there were ships from, uh, you know, from Italy and from France, but the Greek merchant fleet had a considerable um, role in the trade in the Black Sea. And so, yes, in that sense, and of course, the Decemberists met some of these people. I mean, in the literature on the, particularly the Russian literature on the Eteri, on the Philiki Eteria, there are plenty of people, Greeks that these guys, the, the, plenty of Greeks in the, in the Eteria that met various Russians, not just Decemberists, mm -hmm. but they did meet some of the Decemberists. And in that connection of people in Odessa and Kishinev that's behind, probably behind Pestel's report are some of the Greeks who, after all, most of them in Odessa who were Greeks in this organization were not noblemen or fanariots like Ypsilanti. They were mostly merchants mm -hmm. or clerks of merchants. Great. Thank you, Paul. This was a great introduction to our series and I'm very happy it was you that did it. Uh, there are no more questions, but um, I want to thank you on behalf of everybody in the program and also thank our audience for uh, following us today. So again, thank you and uh, have um, a good rest of the day, everybody. <laughs>
Good. Well, thank you, Yorgos. It was fun talking about it. I had to read things that reread things that I haven't read in many years, and I discovered that you know that they were just as interesting this time as they were many years ago. It's a it's a great story, and there's a lot of a lot of um, interesting material in there. Okay. Thank you, everyone, and uh, we'll meet again on the same topic, but uh, the Ottoman Empire and the United States. Good. So, okay. Good afternoon, everyone. Bye bye.